Welcome to Saxe's Pre-AP Chemistry Podcast. This is our second one in our unit um, number one. This is probably a lot more similar to what most of the podcasts are going to be like. They're going to be taking the notes. Just instead of taking the notes in class, you're going to be taking them at home. So today we're on page five, and we're going to be looking at the scientific method, which you've talked about, I know, in middle school, and you talked about in biology. And we're just going to kind of talk about how it's going to be relating to chemistry. And it is going to look a little bit different. So, you know, a definition. Write this down. It, what is it? And it's really can be more vague than some of what you have been seeing. It really just needs to be right here is this key word, most important word. It has to be a systematic approach. There has to be order to it. And that's why when we set up our lab books, you're going to see there's specific orders. It has to be a, show an organization. And you can use, you will use scientific method in all of your sciences. You use it outside of the sciences, but when we're talking about that scientific method, it's research. And you'll definitely hear about research and studies have shown, and you know that they've gone through this process. And again, here's this key word, systematic, organized 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 this is what we're going to have um, an expectation of you guys that you are going to try to help you to be organize your thoughts so that when you have a lab you can kind of make sense of it and that we're doing labs for a reason and there's a purpose to it so whenever you do a lab really a big picture big picture you look at the sky you make an observation from that observation, you see something and you go, huh, I wonder why. You start asking questions. Then when you start asking questions, you're going to start making some predictions. And then when you make a prediction or hypothesis, then you want to say, huh, I wonder if I'm right. You're going to test that. That's going to be an experiment. Then what are you going to do from your experiment? You're going to collect some data. How did I do from this? Then from that, you're going to make some conclusions. But a lot of times you can't do that conclusions yet because from this data, from this test, you make new observations. And then you make new questions. And then new predictions. It's a really for many times in, in um, research, it's a never ending, well, hopefully you reach an end, but it feels like it sometimes is never ending process of always adjusting and testing. Okay, we won't always be doing this. Sometimes in chemistry, you have to admit, our experiments look a little bit different. We're trying to test how good a reaction is. We want to do the reactions to try to prove what we're doing. We see in pencil and paper, we're trying to prove it in writing. So what you'll do this year in, in research, excuse me, what you're going to do this year in chemistry is really not going to be so much research based. So part of that picture as you're going through there, you need to always collect data. So the first type of data that we're going to talk about is a qualitative. Qualitative is words. These are your observations that you need to take in every lab you take. Every lab you will record observations. Full sentences, you're writing. What did you see? You're using your words. So qualitative, descriptive. So the other type you will be taking, quantitative. Whoops, random marks there. I do random marks all the time. But look at this, a quantity. Numbers, numbers. This is where your data tables in a lab book will come in. What was the mass before? What was the mass after? Um, how amount did you use? What temperature were you at? What was the pressure? What was the volume? How much volume did it change? What was your volume before? What was your volume after? So we will be doing both kinds of labs, but when you talk about, we'll say it's more of a qualitative lab, then you know that there's no calculations. Some of you go, yahoo! And then towards second semester, we'll be doing a lot more quantitative labs because we'll be collecting the numbers and having to do the calculations to go with it. So after that, you've made your observations, okay, then you're going to make a prediction. It's like, huh, I wonder what's going to happen. I believe this is going to happen when I do this. If then statements, um, hypothesis, we tend to not, again, like I said, they're a little bit different than what you've done. We write a lot of purposes. You might see this in our labs instead of as a hypothesis. We kind of state it as a purpose. Why are we doing this lab? 
Sometimes there will maybe be a pi hypothesis. Um, the Gobstopper Lab, we you could in part two have a hypothesis in part one. You can put that in. Um, sometimes that might be in a pre-lab question. What do you think is going to happen? And that's where it can sometimes shows up in our lab reports. Um, a control. You've got to compare it. You've got to, excuse me, I don't teach you English. You need to have a control, means you have to have something to compare it to. Um, if you're changing something, again, think of this in the Gobstopper Lab, which you're going to be doing tomorrow. You're going to, part two, we're saying, okay, test something. Well, your control is going to be your first experiment when you didn't do anything. So you don't always have to run the control at the same time. It can, it's a baseline. Another way to think of this and what we'll call, it's like a baseline. What happened when nothing was changed? And remember for a good experiment, and remember this for tomorrow when you're designing, what, I guess you'll actually do the lab on Friday, what you change to be a really good experiment, you should only change one thing to really test it to see what happens and what you changed. Okay, the experiment, it's just what it kind of sounds like, that is just the test is a set of controlled observations. Well, it's controlled observation because you're making controlled changes. So in your experiment, you are having some, you're making controlled changes to a system. And then when you do those changes, or you do a reaction in our case, or you're doing something, you are going to then can record the data. And then from that, you're going to be able to draw. So a conclusion is after all of that, you're going to draw a conclusion to your experiment. For us, we really, really want you to go back to your purpose. What was the purpose of your lab? From your purpose of your lab, were you successful? Was it successful? Were you able to draw some conclusions that you can say with confidence that I was successful, I wasn't successful in this experiment? So the next couple days, we're going to be looking at the scientific method. I have left you, we've left you a couple questions. There's one question right after there. What is the function of a control in an experiment? You should be able to just answer that in your own words. And then um, it should have been put up on top, but look at the bottom of page five. After introduction, skip that. Down at the very bottom, there is a bolded statement. It says, give two examples, each, each. So you should have a total of four examples. I want two qualitative and two quantitative pieces of data regarding your bedroom. So that is what we're going to be looking for when we're walking around checking for your podcast. We want to know that you answered that question. We will see you tomorrow. Thank you.